Welcome to another episode of the RAG podcast. And for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. Since early 2019, I've been interviewing the most successful and innovative recruitment owners to learn how they rose to the top of their game. In season seven, I'm going to be having raw, authentic and insightful conversations with agency owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, people across the industry. And I want to be learning about their ambitions, what's happening behind the scenes in their agencies today and their plans to navigate difficult market conditions. I'll be bringing you the latest and greatest recruitment stories every single week on Wednesdays at noon across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I'm super excited to be joined by Alex Woodhead, the founder of a brand new 10-day-old recruitment company called Apera that specialize in recruitment of future mobility. Now, this super, super niche futuristic market is something that he's worked in before. In this episode, we talk about how Alex started in recruitment and went from trainee to director in his first firm, then how he co-founded a company called Strativ and built one of the fastest growing recruitment companies on the planet. Within four years, they had over 100 headcount. They doubled the headcount from 60 to 120 in that fourth year and did 30 million in MFI. And why a year later, he's negotiated his exit from his co-founder and starting his own business once again. In this show, we go right into the detail of how he's built his career, his crazy work ethic, his unbelievable self-confidence and belief, and how he believes that it's not about having the best sales skills. It's about having the best product and building a business around the best product. If you want to scale your recruitment firm or just listen and learn from one of the best leaders in our industry, then you do not want to miss this episode. Take notes. Let's get into it. Without further ado, Alex, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. I think we've talked about doing this for a few years, haven't we? And we finally finally got it in. We have. I nearly didn't think it was going to happen with the technology failures we've had this morning, but we got there. We got there. We are in. We are in the middle of January. We're both in our outhouses, offices, I believe, working away in uh, the modern way that we do. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm excited about this one because, like I say, you've been on my radar for years with some of the stuff you've done. And um, I think it's a good time with your, with your new venture. So, look, I've done a really brief introduction. Do us a favor. Before we get into the story, just give us the bird's eye. Who are you now? Like, and what is the business you're about to launch? Just like headcount, niche, location, that kind of stuff. And then we'll tell the story and go into the detail. Okay, cool. So Alex Woodhead, founder of the new business, Apera. Uh, this is actually the first time I've introduced the business. So uh, <laughs> let's try, let's see what the elevator pitch is like. So it's an international talent and project consulting business, uh, working exclusively within future mobility and clean technology. Current headcount, we're at four, um, three full-time employees and one consultant. Um, based in Leeds and Manchester at the moment, plan is to scale those two locations, maybe other ones in the future. Um, yeah, effectively covering all things, perm, contract, RPO, projects, engineering services, the full shebang. And how long have we been live? Oh, how many days are we on? 10 days. Wow. Some might say to me, why the hell are you interviewing someone 10 days into their journey? <laughs> um, this isn't your first gig, right? So you were the co-founder of Strativ. Could you give, I was, could yeah. you give me the bird's eye, the same sort of thing as to the high level like overview of, of what Strativ was? And then, we'll, again, we'll go into the detail. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I suppose how Strativ started out and how we ended up were two very different things. So I suppose I'll start off with how we started the business. So the business was started with a strategy of having a group structure with uncorrelated business units, all attacking different micro niche markets. Um, so we started out with quite a few in the early days. Obviously, some didn't work out, some did. Fast forward uh, towards the latter stages, um, we covered industrial um, technology, we covered technology as in IT technology as well, uh, and then also future mobility as well. Uh, again, the business was exec search, perm, contract, RPO. Um, we did we did pretty well, and the guys have continued to do really well. So I think at a point, it's, <laughs> it's really difficult because you can't get a real statistic, and I've seen so many people post things on LinkedIn about being the fastest growing company in the world. So disclaimer, I don't actually have actual facts that we were, but 
I think in our fourth year, we were one of the fastest growing companies in the world, recruitment companies that is. So end of year four, we were at 125 headcount. Bear in mind the start of that year, we started on 60, so we doubled headcount yeah. in a year. Uh, and then I think we closed out that year. It was a little bit of a disappointing end, but I think we closed out that year on just shy of 30 million NFI. Right. Um, so again, for 125 headcount, it's not brilliant, but we started the year on 60. So um, yeah, we did, we, did, we did some really good things. And you left that business last year i did i did so i left the, the conversations have been going for quite a while with myself and ed uh the the other co-founder um i actually had the conversation and made the decision four days before my wife was having a cesarean for our fourth child wow. great timing alex thank you she was very happy about that one um but yeah made the decision to leave i think i, I officially left in October, um, was the baby which born? was the end of August. Right, so yeah. But that's probably a 30th, 30th of August. Quite a good, surely you've had a bit of time with the baby that you might not have had if you've been working then. Yeah, 100%. It was, um, it was really nice because as this is my, this is my fourth child, all my other kids, I literally took a week off, maybe two weeks max. Um, I just went straight back to work. So it was nice to have some time off with. With the baby, especially having four, like my wife definitely needs the help. Yeah. And we've got a very large dog that's like almost a human as well. <laughs> um, so no, it was, re it was really nice to spend time uh, with her. But yeah, as I say, I'd, I'd kind of, I'd been thinking about if I was happy in what we were doing for quite a while. And because I took two weeks off before, because I don't really take too many holidays, um, because I took two weeks off before the baby was coming, I had a really good time to reflect and kind of make, make the right decision in isolation. Wow. Well, let's get into all of it. Let's start at the beginning. So you um, you started as a trainee at a company called Cubic in, was it 2013? I, uh, I don't even know. Was it 2013? It on LinkedIn. LinkedIn yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. you know, that's just over 10 years ago. Um, so in, you've done a, a lot in 10 years, mate. I've got to be honest, like for someone mm. to have done what you've done. But how did your career evolve as a recruiter? I don't need the detail, but like you start as a trainee. What was the kind of pathway for you as a as an employee of someone else's organization? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I started at Cubic as a trainee. We were really small when I when I joined the business. Um, I think it was I think about three or four. It was part of a group of companies, but in terms of Cubic, it was like three or four. So Cubic at Cubic, we did it was UK only, uh, permanent contract engineering basically and it was engineering you usually our tagline was within high, highly regulated markets okay. typically the three most highly regulated markets are life sciences or medical devices which is what we did the more physical stuff uh, automotive and aerospace they're kind of the three the three big ones i i was their first ever contract recruiter so i started out as a contract guy did mechanical design um i had a really shit first year like i think about eight months in I, I nearly got, I nearly got taken off the desk. It wasn't a case of Alex might lose his job because I think they obviously saw potential. But I had a, it was a really tough start, especially because I was a contract recruiter, which is pretty hard starting out from scratch anyway as a trainee. And it was in a business where there wasn't really contract recruitment, and it was it was a small business, so there wasn't loads of infrastructure or support, which is fine. I'm kind of I'm not one of those people that needs that, but it was tough. And then I remember kind of. <laughs> I remember looking out, looking around the room and hearing stories about how well some people were doing and I wasn't. So I was like, what have these people got that you don't have, Alex? So I was like, nothing, just keep going. Um, anyway, knocked my first couple of deals in, I suppose about eight months in, then did really well for that four month period. Can't honestly remember what I got my weekly runner book up to, but did really well. And then I actually became a, a senior and then managed my first person within four months of doing well. So I did that in kind of less than a year. Um, again, not to give myself on a pat on the back too much, but then after that, I suppose after about a month, 11 or 12, I was top biller in the business every single month for every month that I was there. Yeah, sounds like me. Um, so did, did quite well. Um, what you put it down? To? Yeah. And then, what do I put it down to then? I suppose what I put it down to now is probably, it's probably a, it's probably a similar thing. Like I, I honestly, Sean, I, I Everyone, everyone, kind of. I suppose everyone at Strata, if not as definitely not everyone in the world, they kind of looked at me as like a sales god, and they're like, "Alex, how do you win so much business, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But I genuinely don't think I'm the best salesperson in the world. 
and this is just something I've thought I've come so close so many times to re like responding to people's posts on LinkedIn about when people talk about the sales strategy and being just obsessive with the sales strategy. I just look at things slightly different and I look at having the best product in the world, I suppose. And then in recruitment, especially in the early days as a consultant, how do you get the best product in the world? You know, absolutely everything and everyone within yeah. that niche. Yeah. And that is how you become good. When you've got to that point, it doesn't actually matter how good you are at sales. It doesn't you don't need to do that you, much sale. Exactly. You got, the, you got the product straight away. So I became obsessive with that. Um, I love, I, I started out doing, as I say, a bit more generalistic, but then I moved more into aer uh, aerospace, automotive, F1. I'm a massive petrol head. Um, my old man used to own racing teams. Like I grew up with cars, listening to, listening to the sounds of engines and guessing how many cylinders they are and stuff. So I've always loved that. So I just, I just found it really interesting. Um, and again, everyone's different. I think I probably would have struggled doing some markets like finance, like IT and tech. I would have struggled doing that because I just personally don't find it that interesting. I know some people do, but I don't. Um, but because I loved automotive aerospace and all those technologies, then yeah, I kind of became obsessive, learned loads about it. And that kind of, that ad added to, I just work like an absolute beast. I always have been and I always will do. And I just don't ever stop or take no for an answer. You got a level of confidence about you that I noticed the first time we spoke back in, I think it was 2020 or whenever we first met. You, you, uh, it's like it's, a, some might call it arrogant. I think you're confident. And what, where does that come from? Like even then it sounds like you, the first, you know, you're having a bit of a wobble at the start of recruitment. What are people doing better? Nothing. Carry on. Like it's like a, where does that come from? Yes. <laughs> it's a, it's a funny one. I remember speaking to um, I remember speaking to the COO at our old business uh, at Strativ, Omar, and I remember him. We were sat, I think we were sat outside a pub or something, having a drink, and he said to me, "We were talking about superpowers," and he said, "Alex, your superpower is your confidence." Um, and I was just like, "No, it's not." Like I'm actually, not, I'm not the most confident person in the world. I just, I, I don't think it's confidence, and it's definitely not arrogance. I think it's belief because. And I think this about everyone, by the way, it's not just myself. I don't think there's anything in the world that I can't do. Hmm. Like, I know people might think this sounds ridiculous, but I don't think there's anything physiologically different between myself and Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk. Obviously, they're about a billion times more successful than I probably ever will be. But really, there's not, there's not that much of a difference. So I've just always believed. And it goes back to something my dad said to me when I was younger, when I thought I was going to be a stockbroker. Uh, and that's obviously at the point where I decided to go into recruitment instead because my dad said to me, um, it doesn't matter what you do in the world, Alex, just be the best at it and you'll be successful. So that's kind of an ethos I've always lived by. And then, as I say, in, it, in recruitment, I don't, I don't find it particularly complicated. Um, I, 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 I back myself that if I don't know what to do, I'll teach myself how to do it and I'll work harder than anyone else. So it's not, again, it's not, it's not confidence or arrogance. I just have belief in myself. But do you I think, think that everyone... came from your dad then? Did he, did you have someone believe in you as a kid? Cause confidence, I mean, the Spanish con is, is with, right? Mm. Confide with, it comes from others. They, they reckon confidence does come from others and it's, uh, you build it from others. So did you think growing up, you had a support from, from, I don't know if your dad or someone else that maybe helped you believe in yourself? Yeah, I I, I've never, I've never thought about it like that, to be honest, Sean. Like I've, I had, I, I'm, I was extremely lucky to have amazing parents that really set me up for life. Mm. Um, but yeah, may, maybe, maybe, I don't know. But I definitely, I'm definitely not the most confident person in the world. Like, like I, I remember, I think I spoke to you about it, Sean, even doing stuff like podcasts and stuff. Like I don't, I don't love, I don't love doing things like this. I don't love talking about myself and, mm. As the business got bigger and bigger at Strative, like I remember, I remember one of those one of the things people don't tell you when you when you're founding a business and you're scaling a business is you then have to present to loads of people all the time, and it's like 120 people, 200 people, whatever. Uh, and put me on a sales call with anyone, I literally don't care. It's, I don't even think about it. It's just it comes out like autopilot. But put me in front of 120 people that work within within my business, and yeah, I, I don't like it at yeah. all. So, I, I, but again, I I'd, don't know. I think everyone's. I'd still say that you've still got belief in yourself. It's just the, the channel. Some people prefer public mm. speaking than other. I, I'm a bit like what you just said in sales. I'm similar, but I'm also from practice. I don't really worry about public speaking anymore. I'll just, just autopilot. But I used to, just I used it. to shit myself. Yeah. Like it was scary back in the day. Yeah. But I'd say, I don't think I had that belief in myself growing up. I don't think I did. 
mm. think I was quite naturally good at things and I never put I never really applied myself to anything. And it was only till I I got into recruitment, I think, that I genuinely applied myself. And then I, and it was through a little bit of success that I saw believe I, I and, and I think it was the, the boss I had believe, mm. believed in me. She's like, You're gonna be you're gonna be wicked if you carry on. Like and I didn't see it, she saw it. So it's it is it, yeah. I think it's about who we're with that can help us shape whether it's childhood or work. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I've been, I've been with my, I've been my wife now for. I met her when I was twenty, right. and she's always been a pretty huge like driving force behind kind of what I do, and she's always kind of believed in me and backed backed me up. But I think even even when I was younger, um, I don't, I, I don't think I was ever the kid that was the most naturally gifted at things. But like, I played rugby. I got to a pretty high level in rugby, um, and it's just because I worked hard. I just worked harder than everyone else. Yeah, my coaches probably will say something totally different as well. Because yeah, anyway, they didn't like me towards the end. But um, I just yeah, I, I don't. It's like I, like I don't think I'm the most naturally gifted person at any one thing. But I'm just a pretty rounded person, and I just work really hard, kind of in application. But then I also work really hard on myself as well. Like I remember, I remember setting up strategy. I've, I've actually done the same in every job in my career. I, every single day, I ask myself. To, I, not even at the end of the day. I do it at like lunchtime as well. I say to myself, "Are you leaving everything on the field, Alex? Are you, are you doing everything you're capable of?" And the answer is usually no. Yeah. So then you usually t- try and turn it up a notch. But I've always done that. Yeah, I've. I don't think I sit and do that specific question, but I always feel like I've not done enough. And my wife always says to me, "Like, I don't know anyone who works like you." And I'm like, "Yeah, but I feel like I'm leaving. I'm not quite giving it enough." So she's like, mm. "Wow, fucking hell! If you could do more, good on you." But there's something in you. I think that's something you either have or you don't. I don't think you can give. You can you can't you can maybe build it in a child, but I'm not sure you can give that to an adult that desire to to push themselves. Yeah. So talk to me about when did you know you were starting Strativ? What was the kind of tipping point that you were going to be an entrepreneur? <laughs> um, it's really funny because I think loads of people, not loads of people. How, how, how to word this? I think we're especially in a generation now where every single person thinks they can only be they can only possibly be successful if they call themselves a founder or a CEO yeah. or set their own business up. Yeah. Even though often at times it might just be a business of one, it doesn't matter to them. They're a CEO and a founder, an entrepreneur, therefore they're successful. Um, I've not actually always looked at it like that. Yeah. Like I was actually pretty, I was pretty happy at Cubit for quite a long time. Um, I just kind of, I got to the point of Cubit, and this is, I suppose it's kind of similar to Strat, even though it's obviously very different because I co-owned it, but um I think at Cubic, I just got to the point where I wasn't learning anything anymore. I couldn't go to anyone to help me or make me better. I, I, I probably was getting a little bit bored. And I think the biggest thing was I just didn't like how we did things. I, just, I, 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 I didn't like a lot of how we did things. And obviously, that's one of the reasons why we were kind of Can you give me an example strative. of just what you wouldn't... It doesn't have to be detail, but what, is it, um, what didn't you like? Yeah, so I mean, the little thing, and this is obviously quite a long time ago now, and obviously we totally broke the mold, mold at Strata this, but stuff like fixed working hours, like not being able to work from home, mm-hmm. like not being able to do, like there was no laptops, there was like ways of selling things. I remember I remember at one point I, I'd heard people were invoicing uh, clients on signed contracts, not start dates. So I was like, we should definitely do this. Like this is going to eat, this is going incre- to, this is going to increase our cash flow position like substantially. Um, but it was just like, no, it's not what we do. We don't do things like that. I wanted to do more in Europe. I'd done bits again, kind of right. resistance. You're doing so. You're doing so well in the UK, Alex. Why don't you just stick with this? I mean, I look at what some of the guys at Strata did, and obviously, I didn't build loads um, in, in the latter stages. But like, I think at one point, I had at Cubic. About I dual desk at Cubic as well. Um, I think I had like 48 contracts at one point in my peak. Mm, it's a big moment, big money. Like average average margin at Strata is like a thousand a thousand pounds a week. Right. <laughs> if I had that many contracts to do in the market, I'd be like, wow, yeah. I, I'm really doing well. Um, so I think I think it was just little things like that, and all, how we hired, how we positioned ourselves, our brand, all of those things. Again, the product. You're not talking about with the product. Like it just felt. A, <laughs> And it's nothing negative towards Cubic, but it just felt a bit basic. But I also feel most of the recruitment industry is just a bit basic in terms of the product. It is literally just a CV or whatever it is. Um, it's not what I've come to develop, which is a proper package and portfolio of products to give to a customer. Um, so there was, there was loads of little things, but I suppose the main thing was I wasn't at, like I was really well compensated. I had a had a great life. 
I didn't leave because I had that itch to be. To so why didn't you go to somewhere else then? Um, I think again, I think it's that thing of wanting. I wanted to create a business, which is what, my vision of what a perfect business is. Do you think you were unmanageable at that point? I mean, yeah, maybe they might say no. I, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think that I was, but. Um, but I think know. a lot of people, when they get that, is one of the kind of you get to a point where you could join another company, but the thought of being managed again doesn't excite you. Like it's like it's not even about being a founder for me. It was like it's not even necessarily the founder of success. It's it's just doing it myself without having someone above me telling me how to do it. I wanted to go and do it. My it's way. Yeah, it's more it's more the how it's more the how things are done and how to do things and what the what the company does that I'm bothered about as opposed to like calling myself a founder. Yeah, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it, it, I think it got to that point. I mean, but I mean, <laughs> to be totally honest, um, I mean, I don't know if they'll listen to this. I've actually not spoken to the guys since since I left, but I actually found it really hard. Like, I'm a, I'm a really loyal person. I always have been, and I found it really hard to leave. Um, I obviously created friendships with the with the owners. Uh, one, well, obviously, one in particular. I found it really hard to leave, and I might have actually prolonged it longer and longer. Um, they actually found out that I'd already that I'd set up a limited company and I was planning to leave, so right. kind of forced my hand a, a little bit. But they found out on Christmas Eve, which wasn't oh shit, wasn't brilliant. Obviously, got an email on Christmas Eve saying you've been suspended for gross misconduct for setting up a rival company. I was like, oh, wow. brilliant. Wow. <laughs> so were you hitting um, some? So talk us through that journey. Then you start Strativ. And were you under some form of like proper non compete then? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was, a, I was, a, I was a director phasing into MD at Cubic. So, but I wasn't a shareholder, and I kind of, I didn't want to be a shareholder just because I, again, I think a lot of people see shares and think this is brilliant, but you also have to think about what companies are get, getting for giving you those shares, and often it's very, very strict non competes, and they're usually for twelve months, and they're very enforceable. Um. So I, I did have restrictions, but it was actually, it, obviously how Strative then happened was quite serendipitous, really. We, um, so I'd set up my business. This is so random. My business was called Str Stratosphere Global, Stratos for short. Um, I'd set that up. I was, I was in the period of being suspended. I hadn't officially left Cubic. Um, and then I was actually looking for an office, and then a friend of mine said, why didn't you share an office with Ed? So I was like, okay, fair enough. I'd met, I'd met Ed a few times through mutual friends. But you didn't know him. But it was always a really fun. I, I knew him, but we didn't. I don't really talk about what I do with my friends. Yeah. Uh, usually, because I mean, if, some people, if you say you work in recruitment, I think you work in a call center, and then some people just don't really get it. So I just don't really talk about it. Um, and I'd met him, as I say, and then I was like, I, we met each other, and we were like, what, what should we share an office? Like, what do you do? And then we were like, both do recruitment. I was like, this is really weird. Because I, at that point, like most people probably in the UK, I worked in Manchester. So I, I'm from Leeds, but I worked in Manchester. I, I moved to Manchester out of uni. I, I didn't think recruitment existed in Leeds. Yeah, like, I literally didn't think anyone did it at all. Because again, I wanted to move back to Leeds, and that was another big thing. Why, why I wanted to leave Cubic because I wanted to move back to Leeds. Yeah. Because uh, I had my kids then, uh, and I missed my friends. So um, yeah, we basically just met. Ed had actually already started Strativ. It was like a month or two old. Um, so there was another guy as well, who's a guy called uh, Darren Jack, who we just call the rock and roll recruiter. Uh, he's an older guy, just brilliant biller. Mm. Didn't want to manage anything, but he obviously, he was a shareholder in the business in the early days and really helped to scale. But um, yeah, Ed, Ed just basically said, and I'd had loads of offers to go into business with people and I never wanted to do it. And it was mainly because I'd, I'd, a lot of people didn't align with my vision of, how I wanted to run the business. I met Ed, really impressive guy. He'd already set up and sold a recruitment business. Uh, like I'm pretty young, but he was, he's a bit older than me, but also pretty young for what he'd done. Mm. And uh, yeah, I remember one of the things he said to me was, do you think like, do you think your, do you think your pound by yourself will be worth more than a slightly smaller percentage, but doing it with me? And then at that point I thought, do you know what, let's do this. So as I said, so at that point, I kind of merged my business into Strative. And were they recruiting um, similar markets and stuff? Ish, ish. It was a very different business. And again, one of the reasons why I kind of, I liked doing things with Ed is 
I did te- I did like engineering high tech permanent contract before. Mm-hmm. I did exec search. I'd always wondered what exec search was like yeah. and what it was. Um, so again, I thought to myself, I'd like to learn that. But then also, you put exec search in with permanent contract. You, you're placing the CTO, CEOs, the decision makers, and then all you're doing is funneling yeah. down after that. The team, yeah. So we thought that worked really well. When we started the business, it's really funny looking at the strategy now. No one would actually believe this, but when when we started it and I merged in in Strative, there was social care, which I was just like, "Why are we doing this?" <laughs> uh, nothing against social care, obviously, but it's just alien to me how like how it works. Yeah. Uh, and then it, industrial technology was the other main one, uh, which is what Darren and Ed were doing most of. And then I built, I started out doing aerospace. And then my role for the first, Ed was always like the operational manager of the business. He wasn't, Ed's not really a sales guy or he doesn't love necessarily love recruitment. He's just a, like a really good business leader. Yeah, yeah. Um, my job was to build uh, what was then aerospace, but then became future mobility. So I was hands-on sales, winning clients, making placements, hiring and growing a team. Um, and then that was my role at Strative. Obviously, I split it between doing that and also all the company-wide stuff as well that I had to do. But that was my role at Strata for the first three, three years, three and a half years. What and year did you start Strata again? Was it? Uh, I think it was 2019, was it? Yes, it's not long ago. In reality. Just no, it's not long ago. It's just before the it's pandemic. It's not long ago. Yeah, but then we, oh God, yeah, pandemic, that was interesting. We did, aer- we did aerospace in COVID, like imagine what that was like. So what, what, how old was the business when you were into the pandemic? About a year or less? Um... Yeah, I can't remember when the pandemic started. March 2020. I could still rem- I could still remember being in the office and like people showing like funny memes about COVID of the- as this weird thing that was happening in an- in another country. I can still remember. Um, but um, yeah, it was. I mean, that was that was really bad. Like, I know it's bad for everyone, but apart from maybe hospitality, aerospace was absolutely screwed. Yeah, yeah. like absolutely screwed. So like we had, I think at that point we had, I think it was four or five of us in aerospace. Um, so we just had to totally pivot. We totally pivoted. And that's obviously the pivot that we made then just worked out so damn well. And that's what we continued doing after. So we pivoted away from, um, I suppose we worked in more like traditional aerospace. Like we did a lot in like aircraft interiors, a lot of special mission aircraft, which is basically where a company will get an aircraft, whether it's a helicopter or a plane, and they'll customize it and modify it for a, a special mission application. It might be air ambulance, police helicopter, it might be a military aircraft, like absolutely anything. The thing with aerospace that I love is the regulations are just insane. Like to even to even a seat to develop a seat that goes into an aircraft, like it takes like 10, 15 years, and you have to do so, like you have to pass all the stringent regulations. You have to do like five G and sixteen G testing, flammability testing. Like it's really hard mm. just to do a seat. So like even changing little things on an aircraft is a huge undertaking. So that's what we used to do. Um, but then obviously everyone closed the doors in COVID, so then we had to fully change. And there was a new thing coming out. Um, with a lot of scale up businesses that were all seed and series A funded, not revenue generating, just trying to develop a product. And that, that industry was, it's called urban air mobility, which again, if anyone follows Strative, they'll know all about this. Um, but it's effectively electric, electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft that will be used as flying taxis. So these things carry between two to five passengers. They're fully electric, zero emissions. They take off vertically, no airport, no runway. Um, and the idea behind those is it's kind of twofold. One is inner city transport. So like in London, for example, getting from one side of London to the other, you can do it as the crow flies, no traffic in say five minutes, zero emissions. Perfect. It's a bit like a helicopter. Uh, but then also uh, city to city transport but as this well. This isn't happening so, yet though, right? This isn't live. Uh, it's it's going to happen soon, yeah. You can you, you can Google it. So this, again, this is we, we did loads in this industry and I, I can confidently say we dominate this industry globally. Oh, we did it so all this anyway. pre, but these are all businesses that are building the products that are going to go, go live yeah. in the future. When And then yeah. you're telling us that all the skies are going to be dominated by aircraft in the future then. Is that what's going to be like constantly, like <laughs> Hopefully. birds? Hopefully. Hopefully in one Hopefully, way. It'll be, yeah. a bit, it'll be ugly as well, won't it? Just looking at your sky, seeing constant <laughs> things move. 
Yeah, I mean, there's loads of there's loads of challenges associated. Yeah. Like one of the biggest challenges, like it's the same with EV. It's getting enough enough power out of the battery for to, to sustain forward motion for a long period of time. Hmm. The obviously the thing that makes it substantially harder with aircraft is that thing's got to fly. And then the problem with batteries is the more batteries that you put in an aircraft to get more. If you want to get more ba- if you want more power, you might say put more batteries in. The more batteries you put in, they're really heavy. Yeah. So it's counterproductive. So a big a big technical challenge is the actual power itself, um, but then obviously another huge challenge is the airways and infrastructure behind that, like air traffic control. How is how is that going to work? Yeah, it just people it's flying the, into each other in the air and then coming down on top of people in the yeah. Air. Well, some of them pretty frightening. Some of them will be fully autonomous. Some of them will be piloted. But there's actually a company in the US that have just launched a. And this is literally you can buy you can actually buy this now. Mm. They're, they're called uh, Pivotal. They used to be called Opener, but they're rebranded. Um, there's a company in the US now. It's a personal aircraft. It's personally VTOL. You can buy it, and literally you're sitting in it. I don't know if you need a pilot's license. I don't think you do. Uh, and you literally sit in it, and you can just off you go, fly away, fly from Leeds to Sheffield if you want. But is it legal it's in the UK? You wouldn't be legally allowed to do it, would you? To go and fly. I, I would potentially not, but it's the thing is there is regulations around small air, there's regulations around small aircraft that mean that you can fly stuff up to a certain size. Again, I don't know the I don't know the legality of that inside and out. And it's they're a Silicon Valley based company. They're backed by Larry Page, um, but yeah, it's happening. It's mental. It's absolutely mental. And some of these some of these companies like they've, they're, I mean. A lot of them have float. They've gone. They've come from nowhere, and they've floated on the. A lot of them floated on the stock market last year for like three billion a piece. Like they're not. They, these aren't small companies anymore. They're yeah. not. They're very serious companies. Uh, so it's amazing, and I. That's the thing I love. It's really like, exciting. Love, it's really interesting, isn't it? Like even I love it. Honestly, yeah, anyway. I absolutely love it. And it was. It's really a big challenge I've always had. Scaling businesses and scaling strata. This was a big one, especially in future mobility. No one does it. No one does it, and I can't hire anyone that's got experience in this market, right? So, like this, this was the future mobility part of the business. Which, again, it's no secret. The future mobility part of Strative was the golden egg. It was everything. It, like obviously, the rest of the business did really well, but future mobility just absolutely exploded, and that was kind of a lot of where a lot of the growth came from, a lot of the profit. Um, it was so hard to hire people because no one understood it, right? And because we hired experienced recruiters. A lot of experienced recruiters want to stay in their own market. So I, I had a constant challenge of trying to convince people to work in this industry and convince people that this was an amazing industry. You know, stop doing what you're doing where you're doing really well. Come and do this. No one understands what it is and it sounds ridiculous, but come and do it because trust me, I like I'll make you successful. Um so like the whole of future ability at Strative, no one had ever done anything like it before. Everyone came from a totally different market. I had to train everyone from scratch. Uh, obviously, in time, managers were developed, and then they yeah. obviously trained the guys. But it was, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those. It's funny because pros and cons. Like some markets, everyone does it. Therefore, it's really easy to hire, and you just slot them in, and it works really well. But obviously, the con is what's it, the pro in competition? Yeah, I get, I get the con from a talent perspective internally. But what's the pro externally? Mm-hmm. So you're going into companies that have no recruitment PSLs. They're reliant on you. Like, I mean, why is it so good from a recruitment perspective? Mm. I think it's so good because we became so good at it. Like it's not uncompetitive because lots of people know who these companies are, but what lots of, again, we have those loads of different, like I take strategy very, 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 very seriously. Um, I think like if you don't get a strategy right, you're never going to succeed. So I think we just became amazing at it. And what we did is we became amazing at a micro niche where all we did all day, every day was that micro niche and an EV toll. I mean, there's probably 20 companies in the world that do it, but we had a team of even if you told probably 30, so we had 30 people doing an industry with 20 companies. I'd say 50 to 75 percent of those, well, 75. Well, we worked with 100 percent of them at one point, but we couldn't work with everyone, so we dropped that down. 50 percent of them we had an RPO with, hmm. where we were like, like their, their their entire recruitment team, um, and then across the 30 people in EV toll. I don't know what they'll have done this year, but last year I think we probably did about nine million, eight, 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 nine million revenue in in an industry with twenty companies. Is that because the fees are so high? The, what what what's yeah. contributing to that? Yeah, I mean the fee, the fee we just recruit we recruited a lot of people. 
um, in, into those markets. We had amazing. So one again, what I was talking about with the products, one of the reasons why, I suppose, one of the reasons why I think we've done really well is we've really developed the product and how we deliver recruitment services. So it was very rare at Strativ, especially in FM, that we would just send an e-shop, get a placement, uh, send an e-shop, qualify a job, make a placement. Like we didn't really do, we, it, we got we got way past that. So we, we had loads of different ways of delivering the service. Like we did loads of embedded recruiters, which again, it's embedded recruiters, then they're, um, it's not a new thing. Like lots of people do it, but no one really does it like we do. Hmm. So like our, the embedded recruiter service that we offer, like we charge a lot of money for it. We charge more money than anyone I've heard of. Um, and we're able, and a lot of people are like, how are you able to get those figures? And it's because we compare it with what, how much it would cost for a full delivery service. And then also those embedded recruiters, like some of them filled 150 roles a year for a company. So it's like, it's, it's obviously, it's convincing the client to work with us in the first place, but then it's executing and do giving an amazing service and, and over delivering and over making a client so happy. They're like, oh my God, I didn't actually realize you guys could do this. And that only gets better and better and better. The longer that you embed with a client and the longer that you work together, the longer the partnership yeah. is, the more you learn about each other, the more you learn about the skills, um, the, the quicker it takes for you to source because you already know the candidates, but you don't even have to search. Yeah. I'm interrupting today's episode to give you a message from our brand new sponsor. Now, this company are called Untapped, and everyone knows that Hoxo, through this podcast, I've, I've explained that we, we've built our team internationally, heavily in South Africa, okay? And I get questions all the time from clients and people who listen to the show, like, how have you done it? What was the process, etc. Well, I've partnered with a business that can ultimately reveal it all, share it all, and, and help you do the same, right? Because look, it's been a tricky year for the sector, and many of people through uncertain times have had to streamline operations. However, you know, accessing low-cost resources internationally has proven to be a bit of a cheat code for some people, including Hoxo. But anyone who's tried it, like us, it's very difficult. A lot of work, process to get it right. So this company, Untapped, are one of the hottest companies in the market. They've helped Hoxo, they're helping our clients. Um, and they specifically look at companies in the UK, US, Middle East and Australia transition to using remote individuals and building full offshore sourcing and recruitment solutions. So they source talent pools from places like South Africa and the Philippines. Um, and we're talking about experienced talent here. We're not talking about graduates with no experience. This is like people with three to five years recruitment experience and integrate them into your UK team, okay? So they work remotely, but plug into your UK team. Um, they put around 3,000 candidates per month through an intense four-stage interview and online testing process to find the top 1% or 30 people and secure these people for work with recruitment agencies like yourself. You know, all candidates are benchmarked against UK competency frameworks and the, the way in which you would hire in the UK. So we're not, again, we're not talking about cheap for the sake of being cheap. We're talking about international experienced people just living in lower cost locations. So it's a really simple process. If you want to work with these guys, you pay a deposit to kick off their search. They then provide a candidate shortlist in 14 days. And then you can put people through your own process to hire them permanently, or there's a freelance option. So if you just want to try before you buy, they can employ them. You pay a daily rate and it's a freelance option. Untapped are totally transparent with all the salaries and fees. Um, but, you know, we're talking about you'll still pay about 70% less than a UK equivalent in that role. So it's a no brainer to complement your existing team to handle surplus demand and ease cost pressures. You know, if you're not using this to rip up your business and rebuild it with global resources, then you're probably gonna fall behind eventually. So due to demand and capacity, they're only operating on a waiting list right now. So if you wanna be part of their waiting list, go to www.tryuntapped.com. Okay, www.tryuntapped.com and check out their information. Make sure you say that you listen to the RAG podcast um, because they'll do you a very special deal as well. Right, go and check them out. Back to the show. So you spot this market in the pandemic, you pivot the whole aerospace team to that. And mm. then how did that, what was the trajectory from a headcount perspective? You say you got to 30 people in that one team. No, we got 45 right. in FM. Um, 
So we got to, we got to forty five in FM. I, I guess. Obviously, I, I, I left I left in October, so I don't know what they'll have ended the year on. But um, I, I would imagine it should it should be over ten million. They ended this year on future mobility with a team of forty five again in, in in quite a small market. Um, we then used we used grey areas to then move into slightly different technologies. So obviously a huge part of EVTOL is batteries and energy storage. So again, then we were doing really well in that. So then we built an energy storage team that basically focused on energy storage within EVTOL, within electric vehicles. And then obviously there's there's a big movement towards like energy storage in energy generation, in domestic use, et cetera, et cetera. So then we moved into that and did really well. We then started building out contracts, did really well with contracts. Um, space, defense. So it's all of these aligned markets that most people, a lot of people don't think aerospace is a very good market and it's usually because they don't understand it. But um, most people would do all, like this whole entire ecosystem of aerospace, like one person might do that, for example. But we break it down into loads and loads and loads and loads of little parts. Um, and then each of those little parts we become the best in the world at. And, and that's then we the, move into a slightly aligned one. And that's the, I say this all the time. You know, the, the more niche you are, the better. Like people always see what they're losing by going niche. Like, oh, but I could have filled that and I could have placed that and I used to do that. Oh. But you've got to, yeah, there's a bit of time where you might have a bit of pain because you're turning stuff away. But soon enough, you'll become an expert and it'll just be, you'll be play, you're using the same stuff all the time. Like it's just a recycle of the same. 100%. Yeah. I, on, I can't, I, <laughs> I've had that conversation so many times. Yeah, yeah. And right. you can imagine, especially because we hired so many experienced recruiters at Strativ and a lot of, you know, we, we had a no ego business, but naturally experienced recruiters that have built four, five, six, seven, eight hundred K like that, they have an ego. It's a constant thing. It's a constant thing. But, it, it, and, and the thing that I always said is just look at everything with an abundance mindset. There is enough to go around. There is more than enough to go around. I used to, and if there was ever a challenge, I'd break down the market and I'd talk, I'd talk people through like what the reasons are. And again, what, I suppose one of the things that I've always had in my belt and why I, I think, I think people obviously take my guidance. Um, I've always been really good at sales and recruitment and I've, I've built again, I, I'm not, I won't talk about numbers, um, but like I, I've not met anyone that's built more than I have before and i've interviewed a lot of people so people usually listen to me and it's kind of one of the things in recruitment that if you want to build more in recruitment you've got one of two things once you get to the, once you get to the point where you can fill every job that you get which everyone has to get to if they want to be successful in recruitment uh, you never want to be working anything if you're unsure whether you're going to fill it or not once you get to the point where you can fill every position that you take on you've got one of two options to build more money option one is increase the fee there's only so far you can go with that realistically. But you can charge um, more than other people. You can charge, of course you can, yeah, of yeah. course you can. But again, we don't, we are, we are expen like we are premium, like, but I don't, I've never, mo I've never motivated the guys on working at 35, 40%, like yeah. 25 to 30% is fine. Like that's solid. Like we don't need to go past that because it comes to a point where the client's not getting value for money. CFOs will see a bill and they'll be like, what is this? Like it does, it happens all the time. And any time you do a ridiculous fee. Um, so that's one thing, which again, you can do, you can work the California market, which we did. Our average fee in FM in the California market was probably 70K a unit, right? So like the fees were really good, but you can only go so far. But then the other thing that people don't think about is reducing the time it takes to fill a role so that you can fill more roles. How do you reduce the time it takes to fill a role so you can fill more roles? You own your candidate market, so you never have to search. When you get a job, you know who the person is. Yeah, that's how I. When I did the UK market, how I build a lot of money is I literally worked with ten companies, and I just cycled cycled all the candidates round. It was a really finite market. You had to have specific accreditations to work in that market. Obviously, like I'm, it's probably exactly the same as what you did, Sean. Yeah, it's the yeah. same thing that everyone that does well in recruitment does. But again, a lot of and that's where you obviously give those examples and then you talk about, okay, right. So you're doing this market. How many, how many engineers, for example, do you think are in this market? I don't know, 5,000. How are you possibly going to know all the 5,000 of those people? It's impossible. You've got to know as many as you can though. <laughs> you do? That's the you bit do. that, that people don't realize that like, the network is, is everything like your network. And, and I used to feel I, I was exactly that. I used to do a very small amount of stuff in the Lloyds of London insurance market contract. 
walking a square mile playing musical chairs with people, but I could fill a job in my head before I got back to the office. I'd go to a meeting and they'd be like, right, we need this CV. I'd be like, well, here's, what do you think of that? I'd say, I'm short on my phone. And then they'd be like, all oh, right. And then I'd, I'd make phone calls walking through Leadenhall Market well, and I'd fill the job before I got back to the office. And people were like, how the fuck have you done that? Well, my, my memory's good. My memory is strong. That's a skill set. Mm -hmm. But because I used to have passive conversation all the time with people, it wasn't always about what I had for them that day. Candidates, when you've only worked the transaction you've got in front of you, you'll only be mm -hmm. as good as what you do that day. Whereas if you're thinking, well, I need to know you because you're seriously good. I know you're good. I've, 10 candidates have told me how good you are. I've got nothing mm -hmm. for you, but you're going to need me and I'm going to need you. That's the mindset I always had. You know, it'll be mutually, it will be mutually beneficial to know each other. And if you've got the confidence to say that, to buy someone a coffee, sit down with them, look them in the eye and say, look, I'm going to, I'm going to add value to your career, whether it be today, tomorrow, next year, you need to know me. They're like, fucking hell. Cause most can, most recruiters just phone up and go, I've got a job for you. Are you interested? And it's like mm. two different levels of conversation. Every, every, every touch point with a candidate is effectively a touch point with a client. You have no idea who yeah. that person knows, what's like, where, what role they'll end up in. Like, that's one of the things that I always say, and especially when you do, because we do a lot of manager VP director level positions, uh, or we did, and we are doing now in the new business. It's really hard to stop saying we were trying I know, to. I know, yeah. um, every single person you speak to is a candidate. Every single time you have a conversation with someone, it is a time to one, get some informa get information, two, sell yourself. Like, no call is ever a wasted call, ever. Hmm. Even if they're not candidates, not interested, build a, always build a relationship. You never know where that's going to lead. Um, so, yeah. And how do you ensure that? So what, what people are going to be thinking here, listening, I imagine, is sounds great. Heard it before. But how do you get, it, how do you get a team of 45 and then a wider team of 100 to actually do this? Like what, what do you need to put in an infrastructure management layer, training layer, whatever, to ensure that people actually do it? And it's not just you with a great idea that you can do, but it stops at you because that's what a lot of businesses are like. yeah Founders have all the ideas like, no one just, no one follows through yeah it's really fun. <laughs> it's really fun. i remember in the early days so my, my management style is again problem, it's maybe not perfect like I, I, it's worked pretty well o over over the years uh but it might not be perfect but if if someone's not achieving the, their what they what they're trying to achieve and they're in obviously one of my teams or my business or et cetera. And it, obviously this wasn't when the business was 120 headcount because I've got, I'm, at that point I literally couldn't yeah. do it, but this is where it comes, comes back to building things right from the start. So then you shouldn't have to do it. But, yeah. um, if, 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 if someone's not where they need to be, you, you obviously look at them and are they, are they putting the work in? If they are putting the work in, then it's a skill gap often with that and what i always did and people used to say to me alex you can't keep doing this like even at five they're like you can't keep doing this it'll never work obviously it works up to 45 and it would, it would have continued to work um uh, is I, i'll drag people up a hill and i'll just show them how i do things i'll get them to work with me i'll help them i'll win them quite i'll win i think i saw something on linkedin the other day about saying the death of 360 recruitment is often because found, like founders or managers like they get they give roles out too much and i'm probably guilty of that like, like uh, uh, in Strative FM, probably 90% of the clients were ones that I won and gave out to the team, which in some ways you could say that's not scalable or that's a weakness. But then uh, then when you're doing that and you've got RPOs of all of these companies, you actually make it incredibly easy for the team to then sell because one of the things we did and we did very well was we sold off what we'd done before. We documented everything. We case studied everything. We made everything look amazing. We used references. We asked people to speak to our network. And when you go into a company where... You've like in EV Toll, for example, where you've literally scaled, you've hired over a thousand people and over 200 in each of the top 10 biggest EV Toll companies, a company cannot say no to you. So then the sale becomes easy for them. Hmm. Um, but that's again where it comes from. Doing it, doing it right from the start and scaling up is the only way you can do that. You can't do that if you, for example, if someone went into a business, inherited a team of 200 people, you can't you can't lead like that. It yeah. just it just won't work. Do you know so, what? But luckily, but do you know what you didn't mention there? On. But I think you said it earlier in the in the episode, which which answers the question is the product, right? Because I think if if mm. you're you can be a really 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 good salesperson and you can get by selling an average product, you can. But you can't be an average salesperson and get by selling an average product. You can't. Whereas you can be an average salesperson, but with a wicked fucking product and a wicked case study, like all the stuff you just said, you can go in and deliver 
you know, and not everyone needs yeah. to be like you. You don't need a hundred. No. Can't have a hundred people like you. You're, 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 the business yeah. would implode. No, it's it, it's funny you say that, Shot. So, like we um in the Christmas, we did like a Christmas presentation at the end of last year. What well, end of twenty twenty two? Um, and basically, what my job became was just enabling the sales organization to become as successful as possible. Like I worked tirelessly, tirelessly to make it as easy as it could be for them. So, one of the slides that I went through. Um, which again, initially when I said this to people, they were like, I don't really understand what you mean, Alex, but then hope, then hopefully it made sense. But I wanted to, I wanted to make it as easy for someone in Strative to sell our services as it was, as it was for someone working for Apple to sell an iPhone because yeah. the product sells itself. Like, like, and there's too much to talk about on, on this call now, but there's so many things that we put into the product and the offering and how we delivered the service and how we differentiated ourselves from everyone else. I'm just a firm believer that obviously loads of people, loads of companies I know have had a really hard time this year and lots of companies like aren't scaling that much. And then often people say, well, you guys are doing the same thing. Why have you scaled so much? It's because every client we ever work with, on my watch especially, every client we ever work with, they will never, ever work with anyone else mm. because we do so much more. Yes, it might cost you a little bit. Your profit margin might be, it might, might be eaten a little bit. But the level of stuff that we've been able to de deliver to clients, like market, in market intelligence reports, um, full suite service offerings, e even things like some of our clients, they ask us to go do career fairs for them, just like literally anything and just giving them the best possible experience. Like that, that is such an important thing that I think just people just don't think about because they see recruitment as just a one dimensional thing. And then how are we going to get more money out of this business? We need to send more e-shots. We need to get more data. We need to increase the data flows, send more e-shots, get more first interviews. I just don't run businesses like that. That's no. just not how I do things. No. No. Which it works for some people. And again, that's not wrong. That's just not how I do things. But you mentioned it again before. The strategy is important. You don't, you know, you if it's not the right, I can already. I'm just going to turn, I'm just going to turn my heater on, Sean. I'm shivering. I'm happy <laughs> the whole call. Mate, get it on. I've got my radiator set at 21 degrees right now. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. It is what one degrees outside, I think, in the north. It's, it's actually it's it's snowing outside. Yeah, I've was. got my heat. I've got my I've got my heater on the desk, firing at my face. Well, I've got. Uh, you want to get all the electric radiators? I've got, mate. I lived in a flat in Manchester in in Angel Gardens, and it was all brand new build, and all these radiators. Everything was electric. So when I yeah. when I built my little office studio, I got the same heater, and it's unbelievable. It's not as long as your installation's right. And you're in Leeds, I'm yeah. in Sheffield, we're both in the north. We're both I had a bit of snow earlier, but it's sunny now. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Um look, Alex, I think I can picture everything you're talking about. Because I think I'm mm. running I might not have the scale of headcount that you guys had, but I think the way I've built Hoxo now is very it's all strategy, it's all product, it's all the finer touch points on everything, and it's it feels I can imagine everything you're doing. Um now let's go to the point of exit so why are you not that you say we all the time it's clearly your business you feel you still feel like it's your business or she wouldn't be referring back to it it's like if i left hoxo now it's tattooed there man it's like it's my it's my dna so that's, why that's commitment it is but it's my business right so yeah i don't i've got my wife there my wedding there i'm gonna i've got that there i'm gonna have my baby and my kids there like you can't take that shit away from me um no. even if i left even if I split up, like, it, it happened. I was married at that point. Mm. I set up the business. It is mine. Anyway, yeah. what, what, why are you no longer there? What's gone? On? Yeah, it's interesting. It's obviously an interesting question. And when I suppose, when, you know, when I, when I made the decision, everyone was like, "What the hell?" Like, "What the hell?" Because everyone was like, You're, "You guys are absolutely flying." Like, "What? What? What's going on?" Um, but I think the people that I think the people that knew me well kind of saw it coming a bit um look long long and short of it, like i've got me and ed are still really like really good friends we're going for we're going for lunch later this week uh everything's been left on really good terms um ult i think ultimately when you've got a business partner you have to be so in sync like so in sync and we were for such a long time mm. like we were we were um but i think for the past when we got big, and it's even it was even a bit past when we got big, we 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 basically we just we had different ideas of how we wanted to scale the business, manage the business. We had different thoughts on how to get more out of the business, and we had different thoughts on like 
the sort of people that were going to take us to the next level, right. if that makes sense. Um, so like, it, it was re- it was really, really, really difficult in many ways. And it was difficult because, because I'm, I'm, we do a lot in personality analysis, right? I'm high yellow. I'm a red yellow. So, right? so I'm just I get shit. I'm get shit done, but I make decisions with my heart, not my head. Yeah. So like, and I ca- I really care about people. And in, again, in Strative, like everyone always used to say, Alec, you can't do that. My brother works at Strative. My best friend since I was four years old worked at Strative. Loads of my friends worked at Strative. And the people that weren't even my friends before Strative, they became family. Like, it, and we went through, we went, we went to war together and we did, we had loads of amazing times together. So it was so hard. But ultimately, I, I was unhappy. Um, my wife had commented that I wasn't myself. Like, my friends had commented that I wasn't myself. I, I was unhappy and it took me a while to understand like why I wasn't happy, but it just became more and more obvious that it was, it was because of work, why I wasn't happy. And and the main reason for that was I just wasn't happy with the direction that we were going and some of the decisions that we were making. And obviously the thing is when you, when your business partners and Ed, Ed was majority shareholder, right? So he had v, he had veto decision-making power and wow. that was, that was obviously never going to change, which was fine. I was fine with that for like I was fine with that for ages. Um, did he did he exercise that as well and say like no? Uh, no. Did, he, did it feel like? No, no, no. He's he, he's 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 not like that, Ed. Like he's he's just not. He's a, he's a lovely bloke and he's got no ego behind him at all. But inevitably, somebody has to make a decision when there's differences of opinion. Yeah. Um, and like it, it, it was just yeah, it just. It just became, it became the, it didn't become the business that I wanted. Um, and I, I, I looked at it and I thought how much energy it's going to take to, to kind of make the changes and would I actually be able to make the changes successfully? Because again, one of the things that I've learned, change is fucking hard. Mm. Right? It's really hard. Like I used to think all the people that do change and transformation, I was like, how is that even a career? Like, that's what seriously. I recruited that. That's what I used to recruit. Was it? Mm. But it's like, you see, it's so hard. Like the, the level of detail you have to go through. Cause obviously I've taught loads about market, but all the operational stuff that I've had to learn scaling to hundreds, like I've, I've become a totally different person. You have to round your skills so yeah. much. Uh, things like how we manage projects, like the racing model, all these things, like it's just, and all the over communication you have to do. Like, it's just, yeah. Um, but I just, I, I wasn't going to be able to do it. And I just, uh, yeah, I, I just made the, I, I made the decision that I didn't want to be part of Strata anymore, which is obviously really hard. Uh, well, actually what well, that wasn't, a de- that wasn't a decision. I, 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 I offered to buy it out of Strata. I offered to buy future ability out of Strata. We couldn't come to an agreement on either of those things. So the third option was you buy me out and, and off I go. So that's what happened. We've left things on really good terms. How long did that take like, to go from yes, well, I'll buy you out to actually happening? Uh, I there's a lot of negotiation, <laughs> a lot of negotiation with price and exit and restrictions and all of that stuff. That probably took two months, and that was really hard. Yeah, it was really hard because again, me and me and him were friends, and then we were like, right, we need to have a serious conversation now and stop having a laugh. Did you get a legal uh, so the whole, partner involved, like each of you? We we did, but not too intense. Like a lot of the time when we were talking, we we're still ha- like, we just, as I say, we were still having a laugh, and then we we're like, right, we actually need to make some progress with this now. Yeah. Um, so it was it was hard. It was. I think I remember Ed said to me, I was, he was like, do, "Do you feel like this is this is like a relationship breaker, isn't it? Like it's awful." And it was all. It, it yeah, it was it was tricky, but we got to a solution in the end. And again, I, I think it's probably a solution neither of us were massively happy with, but. It was the closest we could come to agreeing. Um, so yeah, so we got to do, talk about two months. Then sent a message out to what Ed, Ed sent. I, I was still on like the Teams chat and all that stuff. So Ed sent a message out. Obviously checked with me. Checked the check. Checked the message with me first, um, and then I yeah I sent a follow up. And yeah, I've not really obviously not really spoken to the guy since. So so that was it. Like one day you're there, the next you're gone. You didn't do any like build up and say, right, in two weeks I'm gone. We need to do all these projects. No, I think me and Ed thought it was better because I'd been off for maternity. Paternity, sorry, not maternity. I didn't have a baby. Um, because I'd been off for paternity, we just thought it was better that I, I didn't come back in. Which, yeah, it was, it was almost, it's just one of those things. It's, um, I think it was the right thing to do. And just, I, I didn't have a, I didn't have a leaving deal or anything like that. And it's not yeah. that I didn't want to say bye to everyone. It was just, it was just a bit, 
it was just a bit awkward and I also didn't want to kind of have because uh, obviously you never leave and do people have drinks and stuff and I just didn't want to be in that well I'll tell I just, you what I just didn't want to be in that position here's an opportunity right what would you say if, if, if they're listening to this every employee of that business what have you what would you want to say to them like right now oh god Sean put on the spot um, what would I want to say to them well, this is what I put in the message just that, thank you for everything like you kind of made I always I always thought we'd be successful but it it, it did go better than we thought it would so thank you for everyone's like dedication, hard work. Obviously, like I don't know, I, I I may or may not be the easiest person to work with in the world. I have no I have no idea. But obviously, thank you for being patient with me because I, like I had a lot of learning to do whilst I was there. Like I changed loads over the four years. A totally different person to what I was at Strata at, at Cubic. I remember when I left Cubic, one of the owners said to me, "Alex, you'll never be successful because uh, you'll never be successful in building a business because you're too selfish." But I was like, I'm not selfish at all. And then obviously at Strata, I was the total opposite. Like I literally gave everything away humanly possible. Uh, but I mean, as I said, I just became a very different person. So uh, yeah, I think just thank, thank, thank you for everything. I hope everyone continues to smash it and continues to do amazing. Um, and hopefully I see people around. I mean, I walk past the Strata office almost every day in Leeds. So, <laughs> so obviously I bump into some people when I walk past, but um, yeah. It was, it, I suppose the big thing was just uh, I, I, I really didn't want people to think that I, that I'd kind of deserted them. Yeah, yeah. Was a, I, You'd have I brought a lot of them a people in, right? You'd have brought a lot of them in. You'd trained them up. I brought, I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I brought pretty much everyone in, to be honest. And a lot of a lot, yeah. And a lot of people joined fairly recently because, of, like, we hired a hmm. we hired we hired an MD for industrial who I actually left the day before he started, and like he was just like Alex, what the fuck. Um, so obviously, I, I, yeah, I, I felt bad with that, but I kind of, I, me prolonging things wouldn't have benefited anyone. No. Um, no. But yeah, no, I, 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 I'm really proud of what the business is now, and I'm sure they're going to continue to smash it. Like I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure they will. So yeah, just I suppose big thank you to everyone. Uh, we, we did, we did have a great time, like bonkers times, absolutely bonkers, especially in the early days when we were smaller. So when you're negotiating your exit. With Ed, yeah. it must be painful. How much have you got one eye on your next business at this point, or did you finish up and then decide you're going to do like? Cause I've got all eyes. I've, I've got all eyes on the next business. Right. So right. even at the time when you're negotiating, you already know what you're doing. I'm thinking. Well, I'm thinking about it. I'm not executing the new business, but I'm yeah. thinking about it. I'm thinking about what I want to do. I'm thinking about what what I think needs to be different. Obviously, I've learned. Cause I've learned. I've learned loads. Like at Strata, <laughs> um, I've, we, we made we made a, 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 I think. 2000 and yeah, it was 2023. We wanted to hire a hundred people in a year. We wanted to double our headcount, hmm. and we were like, "Let's do it." Obviously, now I'm thinking, hundred people. It's not just hundred people. It's hundred experienced hires. It's hundred people that have come from different backgrounds with different ideas of doing recruitment. That then I've got to then ultimately my role was the I was the CCO, which wasn't a traditional CCO role. Basically, the entire recruitment organization reported into me, so I had like 110, 115 direct and indirect reports. And like all those people that join doing different things in different locations, it almost fell on my head to integrate them into the business, into our way of doing things that was different. So like, and now I'm thinking that was a bit bonkers. Like that's a little bit too much. Um, so obviously I learned loads, but um, I was obviously thinking, you know. What is this one going to be? This, yeah, basically. And then, so when I left, I didn't, I didn't launch the business. I actually wanted to spend because again, I'm high red. Just want to get shit done all the time. Yeah. I don't like. I don't want to think about stuff. I just want to do. So I said to myself, "No, Alex, don't do. Don't you restrict you, everything sorted now, so I can officially start my business." But I wanted to spend two to three months planning it because there's so many things. There's so many little decisions that you make at the start of a business that if you don't do them right, you can't then change them. And as the business grows, they can cripple you, right? Little things like I know it's just a t I know it's well, it's not a little thing. It's very important to a lot of people. Like commission, for example, you can never go backwards on commission. You can only go forwards. So yeah. like you, you've got to try and get it right. You've got to get your business set up and structure right. You've got to get your service offerings right. All all of these things. So I really worked on. I, w I worked really hard on all of that. Um, the proposition to market and there's a lot of different stuff we're going to do at a pair of the new business. Like it's not going to be a, a typical recruitment company. Obviously, I can, I can talk about that in a second, but. Um, I spent quite a long time planning and then literally January the 2nd or 3rd, I started actively trading in the business. Um, 
hiring people. We're just about to go live with the brand, the launch, et cetera. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, it was, I, I, I did a good two, three months planning. So talk us through the vision then. What are you creating? The vision for the new business. Uh, I, first, of, first and foremost, I want to create something special. I want to create something that is a one of a kind that's not like anything else in the industry that I want to achieve something that no one's ever done before. If we never do, then it, it doesn't matter. I'll go, I'll, I'll die trying. Um, but I want to achieve something, something really special. I want to, I want us to have a really meaningful impact in the markets that we work in. So like, I genuinely want to look at electric flying taxis flying in the sky and know we've, we've literally played a huge part of in, in that technology becoming reality. Um, I want to do, so we're going to, in the new business, we're doing fewer markets. So at Strative, one of my thoughts was we were a little bit too spread doing too many different things, right? Again, just my thought. So we're doing fewer markets. So we're only doing future mobility and clean technology. So what, what is that? That is disruptive aerospace, delete like drones, defense, but mainly protection focused defense as opposed to attack. Uh, electric cars, charging infrastructure, space, and energy generation. So clean energy generation. Those are the core markets. That's a huge, that's an absolutely massive ecosystem mm. anyway. But then within those areas, we want to go deeper. <laughs> Traffic, that that sounds like a, a sound ridiculous, but deeper than anyone's ever gone before. That sounds absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to go with it. Um, so we're splitting it into th we're splitting the business into three key areas so talent projects and consultancy so in talent that's that's, that's predominantly your recruitment arm of the business 50 percent of our revenue within talent will be rpo recruitment pro process outsource how we do rpos again loads of people try to do rpos but they don't quite succeed again and whether that's a conversation for another time but I firmly believe I've cracked the code as to how to actually do those and how to do a high value RPO. The way we do RPOs is it's high value hiring at scale, not low value. We don't reduce the cost. We sell it on recruitment processes graded on three things, quality of hire, time to hire and cost. We will be any other solution, internal, external, other agencies, whatever you want to do on quality of hire and time to hire. We're not always going to win on cost, but that's not why you work with us. If you want the cheapest solution, then go somewhere else because mm. it's just not going to work with us. So again, and often if you ask a client, like what's the most important thing to you in the hiring process, is it cost or is it quality and time to hire? They never say cost, right? Unless it, and especially in the technology that we work in, they don't. So doing that, doing search. So again, that's basically our perm hiring. So it's exec search, but it's also critical, critical tech engineering search. So it might be like uh, for the first role that we we're just about to complete up here is a state estimation engineering manager. Uh, which is basically some that works in the autonomous autopilot of a drone. Um, so that's the talent side of things. Then we're doing projects. So within projects, we're going to be doing contract or contingent, depending on what side of the pond you call it. Uh, so contract labor, we're going to be doing proper statement of work, not what I call for Ghazi statement of work to get out of IR35. We're going to do right. proper statement of work. We're going to do packages of work and proper engineering servicing, services consultancy. Uh, and then we're also going to hire our own internal technical experts that we're going to contract out to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that I didn't include into the um, into the talent side of things, which we're going to roll out at a point, but it's not immediate because all of this stuff staged. We're not doing everything from day one, but we have a really structured timeline plan as to when we're going to do all of these mm -hmm. things. We're also going to do higher train deploy in particular technologies where there's particular um, skill gaps. Yeah. So it might Create be like exactly. So it might be like design engineers that and we'll help train them with certification of aircraft, which is obviously a really important skill to have. So that's talent and projects. Then we move into um, consultancy. So consultancy will all be about uh, EVP consulting, marketing support, talent intelligence and data intelligence, um, and all of that side of things. And then there is a fourth thing that we're going to be developing, which, again, this will probably be We'll probably soft start developing it in 18 months, but realistically, it's going to be about two, two to three years till we start it. We're going to develop our own technology platform. But again, lots of recruitment companies try to develop a technology platform. But again, it's totally not what, like we're not, this isn't to enable recruiters. The technology platform we're creating 
is for our customers. Right. And that technology platform, we're not creating it to replace the recruitment organization. We're not creating it because we want to become millionaires because we think we can beat LinkedIn because we're not going to do that. We're creating it to enable our recruitment organization to be able to sell and own the markets that we work in even better and give an even better quality of service and things that nobody else can give to our customers to again enable that they exclusively work with us and they'll never work with anyone else. If we make some revenue on top of that through a subscription model, then it's brilliant. But that is not why we're doing this. Like it doesn't actually matter if you don't make revenue. And I think that's one of the things that I've interviewed with so many people where a lot of founders and owners get it wrong is they that try to do too much stuff. And a lot of people in recruitment seem to have this small person syndrome thing where they're constantly trying to be something that they're not. They want to be anything but a recruiter. They just want to like be a yeah, whatever, yeah. a tech founder or whatever, because they think being a recruiter is like a lower level thing, which I don't think it is. I think it's an amazing job. Um, but they try to do too much and then they forget what actually makes them money. There's very few things in the world that make as much profit as a, as a good recruitment company. Like mm. There isn't. So all of these things that we're going to do, we're not taking our eye off the ball with recruitment and that is our sole objective. And if all of these other things are just to enable us to make more money in recruitment and become more successful and have better client relationships, then that's a win. But on top of that, if it generates revenue and considerable profit, then that's brilliant as well. And what is this an exit? Is it a business that you want to sell one day? Is that the, are you already thinking that far? Oh, it's diff- uh, yeah, difficult question. That, yeah, we had that question a lot of Strative. It's actually really funny. There were so many rumors about Strative, but I just suppose just to very, very clearly set it straight. And this is on my children's lives we have no plan to sell the business no everyone just says to us all the time when you when are you selling the business i know you're trying to sell the business we're, like, we're not trying to sell the business i don't understand where you're getting these rumors from but anyway um so the problem with that was at strata obviously people pe- people like a destination hmm. and it was all well and good me and ed loving kind of running the business because we did love running the business um but the destination's almost for other people so hmm. with the new business I, I will do an event in 10 years in 2033 whether that's a full sale, whether it's a part sale, whether it's raising money to buy other businesses, whatever it may be, we will do an event in 10 years. And I have promised key people in the business that that will be a wealth generation opportunity for them. And the people that kind of, I suppose, entrust their futures with me, especially in the early days, it's going to, it's going to really mean something for them. And it's going to be, we're all going to be working towards the same thing. So that, and again, that's not because I want to sell the business because I mean, what are you, you going to do? Like, I'll just have to do something again because I'm just a workaholic anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm not that person that's just looking in the, I just want to sail off in the sunset and not work for the rest of my life with a big fat bank balance. I'm just, I, I don't really care about that. Um, but again, the event is for everyone else in the business. So most we're, people we're who get that. to the point of selling something have, because they've got the energy and drive to build something. So it's actually mm-hmm. counter. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to, for that person to suddenly then, I've, I mean, I've interviewed so many people on this show that have exited the business. They've sold a bit like you've sold your shares mm-hmm. and we'll, they go from hundred people wanting their attention on a daily basis to no emails, no mm-hmm. input, no, nothing in their inbox. And, and they, they lose the plot and they end up drinking more and their bodies are shit. And they end up going back to starting another firm because that's all they know and it keeps them fulfilled and it's about fulfillment. So I know you're not doing this for money because you've got mm. money and you can make, you're too capable to never be able to make money. Um, mm. Why are you doing it? Well, you said you want to do something no one has ever done. Why? Like what was, you, you've got a great life. You've got four Actually, kids. Why, why do you need more? I'm, I, <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an obsessive person with marginal gains incremental development and small improvements. I like to wake up every day and, and be a better person than I was the day before. So mm-hmm. I've, I've, I'm, I'm gym obsessive. Like I have, I've literally trained, I train if I can every day and I have done for 13 years, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> I don't want to be, I've got no interest in being a bodybuilder or a marathon runner. Like I, I've, I, I don't, I just like the process of going to the gym, working really hard and getting a, getting a small improvement. So I think, I don't know, I, can't, I don't know. My, my children are my proudest achievement and my wife. I am a huge family. I'm like a massive family man. Like everything comes down to my family. Mm. So they're my proudest achievement. But then from a, like a personal perspective, I don't know. I just, I, I just want to build something special. And then also, and I suppose this isn't a BS thing, but because there's a lot of people that are very close to me that, that have worked with me before. Like I, I really want to make them successful. Mm. 
Like I, I, I do, and it's written. Obviously, at Strative, like I wanted to make everyone successful, but I'm going to, you know, I'm not, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a bullshitter. Like I didn't know everyone well enough to adamantly say, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this because I want to make you successful because I didn't know them all well enough. But obviously, the people that I'm close to, the people that report directly into me, like I, I really give a shit. Like I really, I really give a shit, and I want them all to be successful as well. So, I think there's those things, and then also like, I just enjoy doing a good job. I enjoy our clients getting a really good product. Like I kind of want to reinvent a little bit what the recruitment industry is to an extent. I think the obviously you read loads of stuff about the future of the recruitment industry and I, I kind of ignore most of it because I think it's usually a load of rubbish. Um, but the good thing about the recruitment industry is because it's so competitive and there are some really talented people in it, everyone is pushed to like give a better product over time and time again. And I think I would love it when the recruitment industry is just only really bloody good companies and like the ones that do questionable things and aren't particularly fantastic, they kind of get filtered out of it a little bit um, sort of thing. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think we're, you're not in control of that, but the, you can only control what you can control and that's that you're building a great business. What What's the vision from a headcount perspective? Because you're trying yeah. to grow something a similar size as Strat even bigger or is it... <sighs> Uh, I think mm, the headcount became too important at Strative, mm. which was one of the my issues that I had. Kind of, it wasn't an issue, but we just had a difference of opinion on on that. Um, the headcount is not the most important thing in this business. I'm not going to track how well we're doing based on headcount. I'm going to track how well we're doing based on number of RPOs we've signed, client development, revenue, profit, yeah, etc. But obviously, you have to scale. You, ha you do have to scale. So we'll be scaling the business, but very achievable. I've actually broken every single year down into what our target is for headcount, what our target is for revenue, how that revenue is getting broken down, what the ratios are between RPO, between contingent search, between contracts, right, all these other things. Like everything's like literally scientifically broken down to every single year. So my my plan is to grow the business to net fifteen to twenty head headcount increase year on year. Okay. So with that. And that's sales. I'm not tracking operational headcount as headcount because that's that 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 will be there. But the headcount that I'm tracking is the sales headcount. So that puts us roughly at around 150 headcount at the time of the years. sales headcount at the time of a, of an event. Yeah. And with that, and again, I did this at Strative, and I'll do it again, but I'll hopefully do it even better. I we are in FM. We average 240k billings per head. Right, and that was including people that are in ramp up as well. That wasn't just people that have been past six months. That's yeah, very, yeah. very high. I'm, I'm very confident I can get that to 300k per head. So then you look at 150 sales headcount, doing 300k per head, work out the profit margins, etc. On that, you know, whatever they may be, you're looking at around an exit of about 150 million at that point. What do you think? Profit margin of a recruitment business in your eyes should, what are you profit. aiming for? Because some businesses run at sub 10%. Yeah, think, so we. And I think that's great. And others are trying to run at 50%. And what, it's a balance. It's a, ba it's a balance between um, a lifestyle business and a scaling business. But then, so we, uh, yeah, at our peak at Strative, we were at like 42%, which was absolute madness when you consider how many people we were hiring year on year. That is mad. And it's really funny. We had a we, we obviously had a non-exec, whether he listened to this or not, he was like, guys, you're making too much profit. We used to tell us all the time, making too much profit. You need to, it needs to be about 10% for a scaling business. Um, I, I don't know. I definitely don't think it should be less than 10%. I definitely yeah. don't think it should be less than 10%. There's a few little there's a few little things that kind of just key, me key mechanics of scaling a business, like things like always having at least three months of your three times your most expensive month constantly always in the bank. Yeah. Just little things like that. Profit percentage wise, I don't really want to drop below 20%. Yeah. Ever. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't see why we'll have to, but again, we'll see what happens. This is the thing when you're scaling a business, it, you go like that, don't you? You can, you can have the best plan in the world, but we'll yeah, see what happens. Of course. Um, but I, yeah, I think around the 20% mark, I think anything less than that, you play, you, 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 you're playing quite a dangerous game. Especially if a lot of that is like, I'm trying to think how to word it. If you're at sub 10% profit and you've got a lot of people like, and you've got a few people making loads of money and the rest of the business isn't making loads, which is usually the story in a recruitment company, yeah. you're running a really high risk. 
right? Because yeah. a few of those people leave or those markets dip or whatever happens, if you're only running at 10% profit, you're not going to have loads of cash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's going to get that's going to go down to that's going to go down to loss pretty quickly. Yeah. So like, I I, th- I think ten percent and under. I don't think it's particularly smart. But again, if it's for a short period of time, in a very well thought out plan, in order to get to the next level, then it kind of makes sense. But running continuously at sub ten percent, I think it's not. No, the way to and get. too much profit suggests you're not aggressive enough. Do you think? Exactly. If you've got forty two percent, you're not running. You're not. You're not putting enough people in. You're not. You're not yeah. scaling. So I think. I think net, I think as I say, net headcount increase of around fifty year on year, and that's net. That's including attrition. Fifteen um, or 50. 15, yeah, fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the sales organization, I think I think that's very sensible and achievable. I'm actually going to have to tell myself to, ch- to chill out at times because again, I'll be like, oh, come on, let's eat. let's let's push more, let's push more. Um, but another, it's just another big thing is just get is it, it's not even getting the headcount. Like honestly, it's, it's not. A, I, I think I've messaged two people since I've set this business up, right? Like lots, of, getting good headcount now in the industry, as what I found anyway, like loads of people reached out to me, loads of people want to get involved. That's not my challenge at the moment. And that's not, I don't think that's going to be my challenge for a while. Um, but it's getting those people and getting in the business, integrating them, getting them up to speed, getting them to understand the market, getting them to understand how we sell solutions. All again, what I said about this, the market, nobody does this market. So I have to train all of these people up to understand what it is. And I, I have no interest in, Putting someone bang average in front of one of our top no. top earning clients because they're just going to like, hey, what's what's this? I thought I thought you guys were supposed to be the best. That's why I pay you so much. So there's also that as well. That's really important. It's the softer stuff that people don't really think about. I suppose, or some people might not think about that. That's again one of the reasons why we don't want to headcount increase too much. And I want to continue again. That's net increase, but I've actually I've never had a single in in eleven years of recruitment. I've never had a single person hand the notice in on me ever a direct report. And I want to continue. I, I want to continue that, but you can only do that by properly looking after people. And again, when you hire loads and loads and loads and loads of people, it becomes harder and harder to look after key people. So, in working all that out, I think circa fifty, circa fifty net head, net headcount increase year on year. That's kind of the formula at the moment with two hundred forty to three hundred k average billings per head, profit profit mar- profit margin drawdown to EBIT of roughly twenty percent. Leeds and Manchester. I'm not going to mess around. In why? Why do you need both of those locations? Um, like when you talk about that, a 50 minute train ride or whatever it is, you it's could... four, It's 45 minutes. It's easy. Yeah. Like it's really easy. That was that, obviously that was one of the learnings at Strative. Like it, it, it like the, a three three and a half hour train to journey, which is seven hours traveling per day. Like it's a lot to do and to integrate, and it does become a bit of a satellite office. And it's really it's hard to manage. A bit, it's, it's hard to manage that. Um, so again, maybe I didn't do it the right way. Maybe I don't have the skills to do it. Or whatever. I just I, Leeds and Manchester is easy to do together. I've done it for ages. It's, it, but why it's do you fine. need both? Why can't you just have one of them and because then people go in? The net, the, the, you could do, but it's a lot of travel for some people. And mm-hmm. the network of talent in Leeds possibly isn't where it where I want it to be. Whereas yeah. there's a lot in Manchester, and it's really it, it, obviously we've done it for a long time. It, it, it works. Yeah. Very nice, and obviously I've lived in Manchester for a long time. I know it very well. I know all the. I know all the. Like it's, it, it, yeah. it, it works really well. So only do those those locations. We're only doing the US at the moment. We're not doing anything in Europe. We will move into Europe, but again, I think we're one of the few companies. This one, but I think we did well at Stratton as well. Ooh, drop my AirPod. <laughs> we're near the end now. We're near the end. He's losing yeah. his head. He's losing his. We're, uh, we can do. We can do the US from the UK. Yeah. Absolutely smash it! Like we don't need to, we don't need feet on the ground in the US unless people want to relocate there and it's a talent play. Think in the future you might look at an office. There. I, mean, I mean, potentially, but I mean, we've got. I'm I'm just about to sign an RPO with one of the biggest funded disruptive aerospace companies in the world, who are based in California, um, to do a like a multi hire project of around a hundred and I think it's about a hundred hundred headcount increase. And your team uh, will have to work in California hours, or how is that going to work? Yeah, we do. But again, that's part of the game. If you want, if you, if you, like, this is what we're doing. If you want to get involved and you want to build amazing numbers and do some amazing stuff, come join us. But obviously, this is what we're doing. Like I, I work, I work until nine, ten o'clock at night. Hmm. Like I, I, I don't ask people to do stuff that I won't do myself. So, what is so, your daily routine? I'm, I'm mindful of time. We're an hour and twenty in, so we've gone over. Yeah. But I'm loving every minute of this. There's so much in it. My final question is: What is a day like for you personally? How do you? You got? I've got mm-hmm. three kids. 
yeah. two step kids, one kid, two dogs. I know what that's like, and I'm running a business. Yeah. I've got clients all over the world. I get it, but I think yours is an even more intense version. What What's the day like for you? Yes, I mean, uh, wake up at six a.m. Um, get the kids re- get obviously get the kids ready for school. They're all they're all at school. My kids. So I've got an eight year old. Uh, I've got twins that are both five years old, sit new, nearly six, and then I've obviously got a baby that's four yeah. months old. Get them all ready for school. I do the school run at the moment. Same as me. Which, yeah, I, which I, 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 I didn't used to do. I didn't no. used to do, but obviously with um, with, with us having a baby, it's just not fair to ask my wife it's to do that. exactly what I've... In the last three months, yeah, yeah. I've never done a school run in my life in the morning. Now I do it every day. I actually really enjoy it. I, I enjoy I enjoy it because you get to see the kids, but mm. obviously take them to school, get them to school for half eight, then I go straight to the gym after school. Um, I train for about an hour. If I've got a bit of time, I might try and have a sauna, but I don't usually have time to, have, to do that, to be honest. Get a shower and stuff at the gym, leave the gym, get into the office for about half ten. Mm-hmm. Um, work, work my backside off till about 8 p.m., something like that. Head home. I'll obviously have my dinner, speak to my wife, and then I'll do. Some, I'll work from home. Um, you missed, you've missed the kids' bedtime, though, bath time and all that. Yeah, that. I, missed the ki- I missed the kids' bedtime. But I don't, I don't see the kids' loads Monday to Friday. Which kills me, like it, it does. But every Saturday and Sunday, I don't go. Out, I don't go out. <clears throat> don't go out and get pissed anymore. I don't really drink that much. Um, every weekend is one hundred percent focused on my kids. I take them to every single club, every single sport, everything. Um, I don't go out and see my friend. Like, I, like I, I like golf. I like tennis. But I obviously don't do those things because it's unfair on my children. So, I, I, a week, my weekends are just kids, 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 and then obviously. Try to try to spend some time just me and my wife as well, which is never the easiest. I no. do some of, I, on on a Tuesday. I take my old, my eldest is, is is pretty good at netball, so I take her to netball on on Tuesday. So I finished a bit early on that day, but then I'll work when I get home as well. Um, I think the thing with, you, with with the US is you just you, it's not necessarily like you'll work constantly until ten eleven o'clock, but you have to be available to speak to people at yeah, the yeah, right yeah. times. Right. Yeah, so yeah. it's not I'm not fixed working up until that point every single night. It's, quite, it's you why your mornings you've got it's why you can go gym in the morning though, isn't it? Because it's all exactly. shut. Yeah. I was in exactly. Dubai last week and I'll end up living it. I've I've set a five year plan to live in Dubai. That's my yeah. plan. I love it. I absolutely love I've it. not been. I've still not, I've still oh, not been to Dubai. Don't do that and then work the US market. That'll be a killer. Yeah, it's I can imagine. Four hours ahead of the UK. But I had that similar it's like New York to uh, London. It's like I was getting up every day at six, six o'clock, six thirty. I was doing an hour and a half walk with a mate. I've got loads of mates doing a marina walk. Then I got back, coffee for my wife, and then before the, you know, I've done so much by midday when it's eight o'clock in the UK, and mm. I wasn't working. I did a couple of days, and I did. I was always on my phone and what have you. But I'm comfortable. I could work from twelve to eight every day, or eleven or ten to eight or something, and get. Yeah. A, and still give to my family, like, and be present. As long as you do in the mornings, you do in the weekends, you're going on holidays, yeah. you're still doing the things that, that are really important. And you'll get, I th- and obviously you'll get, to, you'll, you'll get times when you're at work and your wife will give you a call and say, Alex, the kids are asking, asking after you. I think you should come home and see them tonight. And okay, okay, yeah, 100%. If they're asking after me, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. And yeah. it's, it's, about, it's about having the flex to that. It's why, obviously, there's, there's loads of stuff we didn't talk about with Strated, but one of the things we did with Strated, which really disrupted the industry and allowed us to scale, was we had no working hours. Right, We had fully flexible working hours. You could work from home when you wanted to. This was all before COVID. And again, this was one of my beliefs because I hate my, I can't, I can't, hate micromanaging people. I hate yeah, it. Yeah. It's horrible. I hate going through KPIs. I hate saying, it's half past eight. Where, where are you? Like It's literally my idea of hell. I just don't like doing that at all. So we did all of that. Uh, and especially when you've got kids, like you can't have fixed hours. You can't have fixed hours, and that's why it's so important hiring the right people that understand the work that they need to put in to achieve what we need to achieve. But just do it around your diary. Like if you want to, if you want to be the person that takes your kids to school, perfect. If you want to go to the gym in the middle of the day, fine. If you want to be the person that picks your kids up, that's totally fine. We have a day. We, we've got. We've all got a day. Let's just get out of it. What we need to get out. Do it in your own way that works. And, ha- and have that level of flexibility. So that was once, you know, you talked about why I had to leave, not why I wanted to do things differently from the first business. And it was that. And it wasn't anything yeah. wrong with the first business. That's just what everyone did. So what's your vision now then for this business in terms of you've got two offices in Manchester and Leeds or will do. Are they going to mm. be like, are people expected every day, whenever they want? Like, how are you going to run it? Sorry, I said my <laughs> final question, but this wasn't my final question. No, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> um, we haven't quite got, 
the exact <laughs> I haven't quite got the exact um plan with that yet and the only reason I'm saying that it, there will be flexibility however again I don't mind saying this because people at Strata knew I had like we did have issues with attendance at Strata in the office right and there is flexibility to work from home and stuff but you can't be a team and you can't be a community if you're not spending time together and one of the things that I always I've got a few sayings Sean that yeah I'll probably the guys probably hate me for it but recruitment's a team sport it's not an individual sport the recruitment companies where it's loads of individuals sat in a room trying to make themselves loads of money that's just not again not that might be that's just not how i run businesses if we're a team you look after your neighbor everybody works together because if everyone works together we'll achieve so much more individually as well as as a group yeah. right you can't, it's really 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 hard to get that if you don't if you're not spending loads of time together in the office so i think i will want some sort of core hours in the office just to make sure that we're spending loads of times together but there will definitely be loads of flexibility there'll definitely be unlimited holidays um is there going to be a minimal amount of days in the office per week i really don't want to get to the stage where i have to say that but i think you kind of want people to be in four yeah, days a yeah. week if you could yeah. but it, it it depends on people's situations like someone's got kids or someone lives miles away or it depends on people's situations but I, the the result is i want the offices to be communities and I want people to want to be there, want to spend time there. And it's a place where people learn from each other. No, that makes it. sense. So I haven't got the exact, some things aren't fully nailed yet of, they will be when you release this obviously, but just as, as I'm speaking to you today, yeah. that's one of them, but it'll be, it'll be around and about that. It's exciting, mate. I think I'd love to have you back on in 12 months time. I think January, 2025, I'd love to get you back on after a year. I did this with the guys at Storm and it was pretty cool to figure out where they were and where they were a year later. Um, and um, I did it, you know, I've had David Spencer Percival, all these brands that are really pushing it. Mm. I'll get, if you're up for it, we'll do it. We'll do another episode in a year and let's see, see where you are then. But I've got every faith you're going to make some noise. You're going to rip up some trees. You're going to do some pretty cool stuff. Um, if anyone does want to reach out and work for you or ask some questions and have listened and they're impressed, LinkedIn okay? Just drop you a note on there. Is that the best place? Yeah, LinkedIn. Link, LinkedIn's perfect. Um, this we, we want to get to our, our headcount target for this for the end of this year is about sixteen. Right. Um, so we're currently at four. I want to. I, we need to. I need to be continuously speaking to the right people. Probably for Q one starters, I think we're okay. We've got a few more people lined up, so I think we're okay for Q one starters. But definitely Q two, Q three. But it's again. I, I've worked with lots of experienced recruiters. Like it's like it. A conversation might might start now, and that person might join the business in three years, and that happens, yeah. you know, regularly. Yeah. So it's just all about learning more about each other, and it doesn't have to be a there and now, um, sort of thing. So yeah, re reach reach out to me, hundred percent. We're obviously hiring, mate. Good luck. I wish you all the best, and um, yeah, I'm excited to find out what 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 goes on. It's uh, it's it's going to be a journey. Whatever happens. Thank you very much, Sean. Same with you as well. With everything, keep smashing it. Pleasure. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Thank you as always for listening to today's show. I truly hope that you got value from it. Honestly, it's the only reason